right, so we're going to start the um, demo portion um, of the lab here, um, continuing on the topic of uh, CPR in dogs and cats. Okay, so the um, first thing we're gonna talk about here is um, chest compressions and hand positioning. Remember we talked about um, for different types of patients, not only size, but chest conformation, you're gonna wanna put your hands in different positions. Um, and so there's two basic techniques, the cardiac pump technique and the thoracic pump technique. So the thoracic pump technique is gonna be employed um, for a larger dog like a golden retriever or a german shepherd style dog um, and you're going to want to go to the widest part of the chest which is usually the biggest you know the dome area um, it doesn't actually matter if they're in right or lateral left lateral recumbency they can be in either um, and that's also regardless of um, your e ecg being hooked up to them um, they can be in right or left uh, so knowing that the heart is here this type of dog you know is going to be really hard to compress um, in this axillary area. That's why we're gonna use the thoracic pump technique. Um, and so for this, um, you know, I usually say hand over hand, and uh, I'm just gonna start doing compressions and you sort of critique what um, you think I could do better and how I can get more effective compressions. Okay, I could bend at the waist. I think there's a real problem here with my physics, right? So my force and my motion is being kind of diagonally uh, toward the table instead of straight up and down. So I'm wasting a lot of energy doing this. And you can see by the angle here that I'm not going directly up and down on the dog. So if you have a table like this um, or a table in the practice that goes up and down, you wanna do it so that you're like literally right on top of them. In the absence of having a table that moves, um, you can use a stool. We actually have a stool downstairs that we sort of lovingly call a CPR stool. And we really call it that because we don't want to use it for anything else because when we need it we need to know that it is in that exact location and we can just grab it and use it so the best technique is hand over hand and you want to make sure that your shoulders are directly over your elbows directly over your wrists and you want to go down and up and down and up and remember we want to do about 100 to 120 uh, compressions per minute so if you have a clock that is in your line of sight and you can just do two compressions per second um, that is reasonable to do. We talked about the 50% duty cycle, which is half of your time down, half of your time up. So I'll show you what 50% duty cycle does not look like. And then I'll show you what it does look like. I'll switch in between and you'll kind of see how my whole kind of posture changes. So I am um, bending, I'm actually using, really engaging my core muscles to do that. And you'll sort of see how I changed from this kind of, you know, back and forth with my head and neck, which gives you a quick down phase and a spring back versus really focusing on that down phase and focusing on that 50% of your time being down. Because the up is easy, that's recoil, the chest wants to expand. What's hard is going down. So that's what's, what, that I think is what you should really be focusing on is this part. And then I think it will sort of naturally be a 50% duty cycle. Some people like to cross their fingers, whether you wanna do that, that's fine. I usually do just palm over palm with my fingers kind of out of the way. Um, and then for a little patient like this, for the cardiac pump technique, you can do it either one-handed in a small patient. I usually put my um, palm down with my thumb up and just go in the axillary region. Alternatively, if you have a larger dog, you could do sort of a two-handed like that method, um, kind of right in the axillary region there. All right, and then the next thing that we talked about was the ventilation. Um, so using an Ambu bag versus an anesthesia machine, in this demonstration, I have an Ambu bag. And a few things I'd like to highlight are that they do come in different sizes. So much like changing out the reservoir bag on an anesthesia machine, 
you want to make sure that you choose the right Ambu bag size for your patient. So this bag would go with this patient, um, and this bag would go with this patient. Um, these do come in different sizes, probably three different sizes. We only have two. Um, so I normally guide people that if something is like less than 25 pounds, use the smaller one. If it's over, use the bigger one. And then the important thing about the breathing is you want to do about 10 breaths per minute, so one every six seconds. So if you have a second hand on your watch or, again, you have a clock that is within your line of sight, um, one common, I think, complication in CPR is uh, two different ways of breathing inappropriately. One is just breathing frequently, doing this, right? Breathing frequently. The other thing that people do is they want to go like this. And they just want to really breathe, have a big, long inspiratory um, phase on these patients. And it's actually not necessary. The recover guidelines st state that we should be doing one second inspiratory time, which is this. And then you wait six seconds, and then you breathe again. So it doesn't have to be a big, prolonged um, inspire. Um, that can potentially uh, complicate um, the CPR. So why don't you guys come up and practice both the cardiac pump technique and the thoracic pump technique. If you would like to sing to yourself, staying alive, you're welcome to do that. Um, you know, if uh, you want someone to keep a beat for you so you can do, you know, two compressions per second, I'll also maybe keep track so that I can give you a sense of how fast you need to go. I think for first time compressors, the tendency is to compress too fast because you're really excited. <laughs> Same thing about breathings, but it's really important to stay within the limits that are recommended. So not more than 120 compressions per minute here and then about 10, uh, 10 breaths per minute um, for breathing. So why don't you guys uh, start? And you guys can do it simultaneously because in the real life situation, uh, one person is going to be breathing and one person is going to be compressing. Ooh. You can go faster, Emily. Good. You guys want to switch? So a uh, BLS cycle or a basic life support cycle would be two minutes. So you want to do, try to do two minutes of uninterrupted chest compressions and breathing before you switch compressors, before you evaluate your ECG, um, before you consider giving additional drugs. So really the most stressful part is just getting everything set up. But two minutes really can seem like a long time. But all you have to do is just keep going till someone identifies that two minutes is up and then you guys can switch out. So why don't you go? Oops. I'm going to tighten your elbows a little bit and try to act as your whole upper body as one unit going down. There you go. Do you feel a difference there? Yeah, it looks like you're getting more effective compressions. So when you're looking at your end tidal CO2, and let's say um, you were at 10 millimeters of mercury and I had advised you to change your arm positioning and now you might get up to 15 millimeters of mercury. So just considering how you're compressing, how many you know, compressions per minute you're doing, whether you're fatiguing, maybe that's why now the CO2 is dropping. Um, I think that's why it's important to be monitoring end tidal CO2 during this time. All right. We'll uh, switch out. So maybe we'll, we'll practice switching out. So why don't you keep doing compressions? Um, and then who wants to go uh, behind her? So um, someone wants to, someone needs to switch Paula out. So whoever is ready can say, Paula, I'm going to switch you out. OK, and then you just sort of quickly do the transition as really as fast as possible. You can go a little bit back further. I think the widest part of the chest is right there. There you go. 
And again, that might be something where you might see the CO2 drop and say, oh, maybe I'm a little bit too cranial in this patient. Let's go back to the widest part of the chest. And honestly, those little differences can make um, a big change on your end tidal CO2. And whoever just did this can practice doing cardiac if you'd like. All right. Abe, do you want to switch out? All right. I'm going to switch you out, Rob. You ready? Okay. Excellent. That was a nice switch out right there. So the person who's doing the compressing needs to know that the person is right behind them. You can even say which side you're on. I'm, on your, I'm coming on your right, coming on your left, so you know how to exit the situation. Nice form. All right. Has everyone had a chance yeah. to do this part? Mm -hmm. I haven't so, rest yet. I've just been breathing every single time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to well, switch him out? Yeah. yeah. I'll switch you out and you can switch him out. Are you ready? Yep. Come on. Come in. Yep. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Make sure your elbows are locked and kind of act your whole upper body as one unit. There we go. There we go. You sort of feel the difference. I can see that you're having much more forceful, effective compressions now. Excellent. Great. So now when the two minute mark is up, um, if this patient is on ECG monitoring, ideally what you would do is someone would get their stethoscope ready and they would be standing with their stethoscope ready to listen and feeling a pulse and looking at the ECG all at the same time. Because what you want to know is, is there something on the ECG? And if there is, is it associated with an audible heartbeat and a pulse? And if so, then you can stop. You've achieved return of spontaneous circulation. And if you haven't, then according to the algorithm, you can decide, do you want to give more drugs? Or if they're fibrillating, is it time to defibrillate? OK, very good. Thank you, everyone.